Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Knowledge 16, brought to you by ServiceNow. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We're back at Knowledge 16, hashtag no, uh, no 16, ServiceNow's main customer event. This is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship product. We go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Dave Checkerman is here, he's the Vice President and CIO of Oshkosh, not the clothes company. Dave, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you. Thank you. Heavy equipment, talk a little bit about what you guys do. Yeah, we, uh, we are a multinational company. We own uh, 15 different companies across the world, uh, operations in uh, uh, 23 different countries around the world, about 14,000 team members uh, representing 15 different brands. So we were in the CIO event last night listening to Secretary Gates speak, and he told a story about um, some equipment, which happened to be your equipment that they purchased, yeah. and it, it got kind of emotional actually. I mean, you know, he, he basically made a visit to your plant, mm -hmm. personally you know, threw holy water on the deal, and purchased equipment that saved lives, right? Talk yeah. about that moment. Yeah, it was a very stirring moment. Uh, he and a Brigadier General from the Marine Corps, who was in charge of uh, acquisition, uh, both came on Nove in November of 2009, actually after the fact, to thank us. And it was in in very inspiring that we knew as, as an organization, that was our defense group, we knew that every day that he was receiving as, as Secretary of Defense personal updates on our progress. And that's the first, uh, first military acquisition program that since World War II, that had gone from concept to design to manufacture in a year. And in that following year, we, we built 9,000 MATVs that uh, were airlifted two, by, two at a time in a cargo plane over to uh, Afghan Afghanistan. These are the anti-IUD yes, vehicles? Yes, the V-shaped hull that we replaced a lot of the Humvees that in theater. So we made 9,000 of those and uh, we replaced a lot of the undercarriages and, and suspensions of the other MATVs in theater, as well as up-armored a lot of the Humvees. So we took all, a lot of that work and had a large presence. But he came personally, walked the shop floor, thanked everybody, and of course everybody knew his name by then and we have been following him very closely. But a very nice man. And at the financial analyst meeting, you told a story about a snowplow, I don't know if it was in Colorado, or... Yeah. Tell that story. Yeah, it was a, a great story of uh, cross-pollination of our, of our patents and the ability to leverage uh, our intellectual knowledge from our en great engineering group um, from, uh, there was a gentleman plowing a, a pass in the Rockies uh, several years ago. Uh, got hit by a landslide and tumbled a, a, over 800 feet down a very steep cliff. Um, but b based on the patents and, and uh, engineering that we had across applied from the military and from other firefighting um, patents and the business of Pierce Manufacturing as well as the uh, defense group, um, he was survived without a scratch. He was able to be pulled down into a seat like a cockpit. The gyroscopes figured out the engine, cut the engine, filled the uh, compartment with airbags, and put him in a locked position as though he were a pilot. It tumbled eight, over 800 feet down the, on the cliff. He was able to pop the hatch, get out, and call his wife uh, without a scratch. It's unbelievable. And so, it's, so even though uh, you guys are you know high end, uh, yeah. but you got you got you got cost to worry about. You're innovating. Yep. You got instrumentation now coming to, mm -hmm. to your business. What are the drivers right now in in your business? Um, well, being relevant, right? And getting ready, and as a CIO, I worry about things like all of us around the corner of cybersecurity, of course, is present day, high concern for all of us, and a big topic with my board uh, and uh, with my management team, but also um, Internet of Things, sensors, telemetry, all of those things, all, every company's racing to do that. And we make, we make very large things. We're not a big, big three auto manufacturer. We make very large industrial goods that happen to have wheels, <laughs> highly specialized, right? And as a result, they do many, many things, each of which could have a sensor on it. And getting ready for that, I think, is going to be one of my main challenges, is getting all of our systems of record aligned, getting all of our the security wrappers there. We've spent a great deal of money invested in a, in a great security team and, uh, and uh, are doing very, very well in that regard. But getting ready for that next big wave, right? Not the niche applications, but the wave of how our customers use our products across all of those, whether it's a refuse vehicle, uh, a uh, fire truck, a concrete mixer, um, mining equipment repair for IMT, uh, all the different things we make around the world, JLG lifts that put people 185 feet in the air, all of those things share those same attributes of how do I keep the data safe, how do I keep or protect our intellectual property, Is it, it, that's what keeps me up at night. And 
In terms of uh, the, the discussion with your, your board around security, you mentioned yeah. it, it consumes a lot of your time, a lot of the conversation yeah. is around security. What, as a CIO, what do you feel CIO should be communicating to the board about security today in this day and age, and how has that changed over the last decade? Yeah, I think it used to be a wonkish thing that, uh, you know, just make sure you keep the teenage hackers out. Well, that's not really the issue anymore. Uh, there's ransomware to consider. There's, right, there's exposing your, public inf your private information to the public just to embarrass you or just to hold you hostage. Um, there's stealing your political, uh, stealing your intellectual capital for political reasons. There's many, many different things that, that cause you, to, uh, people that want to come after you. And we're a worldwide company. So we, as we win contracts in foreign countries, we, we tick people off, right? And we create a fairly large threat surface. So managing that threat surface in that way with a, with a layered defense, first you're going to get really smart people. You better, as you, or your smart people are smarter than theirs plus defense in depth and resiliency, the ability to bounce back. So we, the, we adopted the NIST framework many, many years ago. Most companies, 40% of the companies do, out there don't even have a framework they're working to. Of all the frameworks, we adopted the NIST fr framework, which is the most aggressive. Spent a lot of, a lot of money, built a team, and uh, we were able to protect the entire organization, the entire corporation, not just the defense facing, but all of our, uh, our uh, commercial facing companies as well. And they, although they didn't like it at the time, they all enjoy a, a very nice veil of, of, of privacy to conduct business and a very high standard that more than meets what we're required to do for the Department of Defense. What's the right regime for security? Mm -hmm. In other words, who, who's in charge and who's got the responsibility and what are yeah. their responsibilities? So I have a Chief Information Security Officer, he reports to me. Uh, but I'm always, you know, I look at this rather selflessly, it's whatever's best for the corporation. Some corporations are splitting it off to a COO or even a CEO, and I'm preparing my CISO and my whole security organization that, you know, they're, they're kind of the, the fox that watches the hen house if they're too close to IT. So I give them a lot of uh, ability to judge the works, the fruit of labor for everybody else, and, uh, and uh, they go to the board. Uh, the CISO, my CISO went to the board and spoke for more than, more than three-fourths of the board meeting last November was, was spent for my update him giving his update, educating the board. So the board's been very, very active. And, and was that part of an update because you'd made some significant improvements? Was it no, in it's response to external threats that suddenly just, became a much bigger just, topic for them? It's just mounting board interest. I think all boards are, are, are realizing for director and office liability and for just responsibility, they want to know, they want to understand, and they want to be informed right away when things happen. But they need to do that. And one of the tenets I've had in my tenure is, you know, my, my my basis as a CIO for the last five and a half years has not been a platform. It's been always been getting the organization ready for rough, rough weather. So in good seas, you make good relationships, you form relationships with trusted partners, right? So when the, 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 the gale is coming, you can speak each other's language, you have trust formed, you know who each other are. We have all those relationships just waiting to be triggered if anything bad happens. And the board is one of them. They need to know those things before those things happen. So what? two or three things, top two or three things should be on the CIO's checklist when communicating to the board about security? Uh, you know, it's a risk management discussion and a level of investment and the shifting trends. So whatever you said, uh, whatever I told you last time, forget about that. It's, the game is different this time. It's only been three months, but the game is different. So every time you sit down, you can't take your rest on your laurels. You can't take credit for what you've done. You got to talk about the threat today because the entire landscape has changed. As soon as, just like the, the war in Afghanistan, we adjust our vehicles, they adjust their tactics. We can make a really good hull for going over IEDs, they throw rocket propelled grenades at with phosphor at you, right, and uh, burrow through, and so you got to prevent that. Same thing with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So we, the defense in depth and resiliency, talking about what you're, how you're monitoring the situation, your relationships with the government agencies, and your capability to defend in layers. So if they do get through, you catch them in multiple layers like Swiss cheese. It doesn't do a lot of good to have one big wall that's all seemingly impenetrable. The one teenage hacker who gets through is in. So you have multiple tripwires, and then once you figure it out, how quickly can you recover? And, and it's, so it's insurance and it's recovery ability. Those are the things that I find they're most interested to build the most confidence. Yeah, responding to yeah. it becomes increasingly important. Do you treat Security as sort of an extension of your business continuity, or yes. is it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're highly involved and highly engaged with the business continuity planning and 
risk mitigation, risk management. So it's really just a giant risk management exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, all the money that we spend on cybersecurity, the team, the, all the relationships, the tools, they're all really just an insurance policy, but our ability to put it all together and connect with the existing company structure, whether it's emergency and crisis management, tabletop exercises with the staff, simulations, different things like that. If you don't do those, it's an insurance policy that you haven't tested. So you're, we're here at Knowledge. I mean, you obviously you participated in the financial analyst meeting on, mm -hmm. on Monday, so you, you, you're happy to speak about you know, what your experience is with, yeah. with ServiceNow. What are you doing with ServiceNow? ServiceNow has uh, been a key part for us for over the last two years. We uh, changed our approach about two years ago, and uh, you know, I, as I mentioned to Frank Slootman, the CEO, you had me at simple. <laughs> Just keep it simple, right? It's the uh, Hockham's razor. The answer, simplest answer must be the best one. And uh, to pull off a culture change where I'm combining 15 different IT groups plus introducing shared services across all the different countries with over you know, 400 plus IT employees, 50 interns and 250 consultants, they all speak different languages, they all have different backgrounds, they all have different tools. And what ServiceNow has been special for me is it allowed my management team to, it removed all the clutter. I didn't have to teach everybody this math and science behind it and implement services, IT services management like an ERP where I had to do it by module and I had to teach everybody the language. It was natural, it was just easy. And uh, anything that got in the way of, or it was a resistor to in free dynamics or free communication with the customer was bad, throw it out, right? It's a little like an airplane running out of gas. If I don't need it and it's a problem, throw it out. Mm -hmm. And we got to be very, very simple. So I, I'm very proud that my team has done a great job. No mods, we implemented worldwide for 700 people with zero modifications, turned on analytics 90 days later with zero modifications. We're getting great data, the customers love it. We created a custom portal with a Google-like search engine. Everybody across the world uses it, all 14,000 team members. Uh, request assets, request services, they get it immediately and our 700 employees are very, very happy with it. So when we're just in the early stages, we're for, uh, our phase three uh, adoption, we still have more to, more to go just for IT. With IT service management. Correct, and we still have more you, to go yet. You, so you've got a roadmap, and yep. you, you got can a roadmap. see bringing, bringing that forth. Oh yeah, yep, yep. We've got the, all the basic IT services management, mm -hmm. the analytics and the discovery done, and we're going to continue our journey with financial management and others as well. We, were you able to get rid of stuff as a result of bringing oh, service Oh yeah, we now? retired a lot of applications. Uh, we eliminated 36,000 workflows. Wow. You know, to get an iPad, you had to have <laughs> six, seven, eight, eight signatures, <laughs> and uh, it was different by every company. So every one of our 15 companies, the process was different. It's now the same, it's very simple, and all of those workflows are gone. How You're many of them again? 36,000. 36,000 workflows are now gone. Are gone, yeah. <laughs> People ask for software, as long as it hits their budget, it's the same price worldwide, and it's pre-approved, it, it gets installed as soon as you click go, it does the double check and it's installed. This is a recurring theme we see at, at Knowledge. I mean, we call it GRS, getting rid of stuff. It's hard in IT yeah, to get rid of stuff. It's very hard. But but we see a lot of the ServiceNow customers saying, yeah, I retired this app, these workflows, these processes. And you know, the big surprise for me and the, and the big, the cherry on the top was getting rid of dysfunctional relationships with other groups and helping other groups along. The process to hire an, empl an employee was very difficult because by the time they got the, the employee ID assigned, I couldn't order assets till they did. It caused us to go back and do 11,000 hours of process work. So I had to dedicate six people full time uh, on just fixing processes between our, our department and others, but it had to be done. And it's not on service now. That was our dysfunction. It was lying around for years, for decades. But by fixing that, I accelerated work in all of the other departments as well. So kudos to my team and those other departments who uh, went into it with a very service-minded mindset. So that was a catalyst. Your interaction with the other departments, you got to fix that, that connection. Was a huge and problem. that drives it, hey, huge. maybe we should, uh, maybe we should fix our side as huge, well. Huge value proposition to say, what if I could get employees the assets they need the day they started? You didn't have to wait till they came, you didn't have to wait two weeks, you didn't have to ask them when they got there, you didn't have to wait for an employee, or when they were terminated or left the company, you didn't have to wonder what they had. And uh, the value proposition drew people, so that you always want to create pull, right? Lean manufacturing. You create that desire and people just want to, to come along. And that team that I'm talking about came from all four segments and corporate. So all the, all the badges, colors, all the company affiliations disappeared and they just became one team 
working for the customer. It was, a, it was a great story. I wish we had more time. You're a great guest, but we have to leave it there. Dave, thanks no very much for coming to theCUBE. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you, appreciate the time. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is SiliconANGLE's theCUBE. We're live at Knowledge16. Right back. Every once in a while, 